all right, what is going on with those narcissist eyes? One minute they're normal and the next blank and wicked, right? And sometimes they just seem like they're completely devoid of emotion. And sometimes they're just staring at you. Why? What is going on? Well, I mean, for one thing, they're just, they need that narcissistic supply. They need to know that what's going on in their world. They need to be constantly scanning and knowing what's going on because that is how they're reading the room. That I mean, they learned from a very, very early age how to read the room, how to read the people around them because that's how they survive. I mean, they are very, very good at reading people. So, I mean, one thing is that for sure, covert narcissists, are constantly staring at people because they are, they're trying to actually study people to become them. They almost are using those mirror neurons to become those people and become their targets, become you. And they want to study how to love bomb you the best and how to to see what it is that they need to become. So one of the things they do is is they they're constantly looking at you to to do that. But another reason that they stare at you and they look at you is because they they do it to control you. They do it to let you know that they have you, to make sure that you know that they are constantly tracking you, that you are never out of their purview. And you can kind of feel it. You can always sort of feel that they're watching you. And it's very, very creepy. And they do it in, in a way that you know that they're right there. They do it in a way that you feel like you're not really a person. It's not a person who's watching, you know, if there's a person who's looking at you with care or with concern or with love. You feel that. You can sense that. This is a person who's looking at you not as a person. It's, it's as a threat. It's more like a death stare. It's more like, I'm going to get what I want. You belong to me. You know it and I know it. And especially when you are in that discard phase, when you're in that discard phase and you've become public enemy number one and they want to take you down, they're looking at you to let you know that you're going to pay for discarding them or becoming that threat, becoming the person who's on the other side of them. Because for a narcissist, you're either for them or against them. And if you're against them, then you are the enemy because now you might know things about them. So they feel exposed. They feel that you could be a threat to them. So they want to make sure that you know that they are watching. And, you know, when narcissists have that part of their brain take over, that limbic system part of their brain take over, rationality is not here. It's, it's here and they're not thinking clearly, you know, so they're essentially logging out. Reason is logging out. And it's some, another part of their brain is taking over. And that's why it does seem like it's sort of an empty stare when they're looking at you like that. It, that that's why it does sort of seem like an evil stare that's looking at you that way. And it, it does sort of seem like they, they sort of cease to exist. Because it's not this part of the brain. It's that other part of the brain that is a completely different part of the brain than the regular part of the brain. It's that limbic system that takes over that sometimes they don't even remember what it is that they're doing and saying when they're in that 
rage part of their brain, that narcissistic rage takes over. That narcissistic injury has been triggered and that narcissistic rage takes over and they start to do things. And it can be quite scary, especially if you're dealing with a malignant narcissist who will tend to do things like stalking or, or engage in acts of violence. It can be quite scary. And if you are dealing with a malignant narcissist, then please do what you need to do to protect yourself and go to a shelter or make sure that you have a good support system in place. Make sure that you have, you know, you've gotten that stash of cash in place. You have a place to go. You've taken care of maybe getting the right attorneys in place. You have the right therapists in place. You have everything that you need to get in place. Maybe you need to get injunctions in place, that sort of thing. Because if you are dealing with a person who is in that state of mind, they're not being rational. Okay. And so it's almost like they're blacking out sometimes when they're like that. And, and by the way, if you do need therapy and you don't have access to online therapy, we do have a sponsor on this channel, which is BetterHelp. And you can get access to that at betterhelp.com forward slash Rebecca Zung. We receive commissions on that. You do not pay any extra on that. We just want you to have access to good, reliable sources of help, you know, that has been vetted. And by the way, if you need phrases for disarming narcissists, you can grab those at disarmthenarc.com, disarmthenarc.com for phrases for disarming narcissists. There's another crazy thing that there is actually a scientific explanation for the evil looking eyes, anger activates a person's sympathetic nervous system or SNS, which causes physiological responses such as increased heart rate or blood pressure, rapid breathing, and yeah, pupil dilation. It actually causes people's pupils to dilate. And so their people's eyes actually do go dark when that happens. And you know, that narcissists will play any cards that they have and if they can explain their unfavorable behavior in some way, you know they will. That's the problem here. We never know when this is actually going to be happening. And so this physiological response is happening in response to anger. And when that narcissistic injury is triggered, then that's when that narcissistic rage can happen. And you just never know when that's going to happen with a narcissist because that narcissistic rage can happen when they're slighted at any time. And you never know when they're going to be slighted because they can be slighted at the smallest of things, at the smallest of things. I mean, they can be slighted because the waitress at the restaurant didn't bring them their drink on time, or you know, somebody looked at them funny, or somebody cut them off in traffic or whatever. So, I mean, when this thing happens, when they're logging out, they're blacking out, this behavior can be dangerous. It can be dangerous. So you do want to be aware of when this is happening so that you can start to see the signs. You can start to see when this is going to be potentially, you know, coming on. And remember, there's never, ever, ever an acceptable excuse for abuse. There's never an acceptable excuse for abuse. Whether or not they remember it doesn't matter. They could be lying, by the way, to get you to forgive them since they weren't being themselves. Or maybe they, they'll tell you they had a stressful day at work or they had an abusive childhood or they have a lot going on in their lives. 
or they could be blaming you. It's your fault. You know, you didn't provide enough sympathy or empathy or enough compassion for them, or, you know, you looked at them funny or you talked too loud at dinner or whatever, whatever their excuses, there's never an acceptable excuse for abuse. Okay. You know, and, and they can never say things like they would never hurt you on purpose. They didn't mean to any kind of apology like that is also not acceptable. It doesn't matter. That's not acceptable either. All right. It is not okay. And I want you to put that in the comments right now. Not okay. Not okay. Got it. All right. Not okay. Whether they are knowingly hurting you or they're just becoming so angry that they allow their body to take over and hurt you. And they just, they're saying they don't remember or whatever it is. You deserve better. You deserve safety. You deserve physical, emotional, sexual safety. If that's what it is, God forbid. But seeing those narcissist eyes change or, and literally get darker is a sign that something is going on, that there's a problem. And you should definitely get as far away from them as possible in that moment. So this show is kind of crazy. So it's, it's about this guy who's a psychiatrist named Dr. David Ferguson, and he and his wife relocate to this new town. And he meets up with this woman who ends up being his secretary and also ends up being his mistress. And all this crazy stuff goes on. It's sort of a psychological thriller. And there's also sort of like some mysticism in it and some crazy stuff. But there's definitely some shades of narcissism and also how to negotiate with narcissists in it. So let's start with Dr. David Ferguson. He starts off by seeming like he's the narcissist because he uh, is coming on to this woman. He's cheating on his wife. Uh, and if you want to know more about narcissists and cheating, definitely check out my video on that topic. But he's like doing this. He's like coming on to her. He comes on strong. He seems super charming. He's love bombing her. Um, and he's giving this whole story like, you know, his life at home is so terrible. You know, narcissists often play the victim, especially if they are covert narcissists. So if you want to know more about the covert passive aggressive narcissist, you can definitely check out my video on that. But anyway, so he's coming on to her. Then he finds out he's, she's the secretary. She's like, no, no, no. I don't want to have a relationship. This is the end of that. But then he's like showing up at her apartment, you know, and he doesn't give up, you know, no boundaries. That's a narcissistic trait too. They don't have any boundaries. So you see them like, okay, I'm going to keep showing up. I'm going to keep doing this. Um, and so finally she relents and she ends up involved with this guy. Now, the next thing that happens is that the wife starts like befriending her as well. And they're like, she's like, oh, come with me to the gym. Let's do things. And she presents herself kind of as the victim. And that's what Louise, the secretary thinks is happening. Initially, she's like, okay, this person is definitely the victim. He's like, you know, uh, too controlling, you know, he's like checking on her and um, and to Louise, it seems like, you know, this guy is like a total control freak and like, he's definitely the narcissist, right? I mean, because narcissists are definitely control freaks. And the fact that the wife had to like be in the house at a certain time and call him at a certain time, it made it really seem like, you know, there's something going on with that. I mean, if I had seen that, I would think that too, right? So that's how it, it, it initially seems. And at some point, she starts to realize that the wife actually may be the one who's the narcissist. Like the wife is actually the one who's pulling all these strings and causing all these things to happen. And then there's this other layer, the third layer, which is the guy that the wife was friends with when she was in rehab. His name is Rob. 
And it turns out that Rob might actually be the narcissist. He's like coveting things that they have. He's like, oh, you have the perfect relationship. I wish I had that. You know, envy is one of the really big narcissistic traits. It's also one of the, the DSM-5 traits of narcissism. And so, you know, he's like jealous. He seems to be um, wanting what she has and pulling strings and trying to control her as well. So you're, you're left with like, oh my God, what's going on? Who's the narcissist? And what am I supposed to believe? Now, I'm not going to give away the ending. I don't want to do too much of a spoiler here because it's kind of crazy. And you definitely should watch it yourself if, if you want to find out what actually happens because it's like a crazy ending. So but I wanted to sort of go back to Louise, who's the secretary, sort of the main character who's involved with everybody in the, in the storylines, except for Rob, but, and, and just sort of talk about the things that she could have done. All right. So to negotiate a little bit better. All right. So one of the things that she could have done is to create more boundaries. All right. So when she started to realize, okay, this guy's married and he's my boss, I'm going to have to go ahead and say, no, you can't come up to my apartment. You can't call me. I'm not going to get involved with you. No, the answer is no. So at, that's one of the ways that she could have created boundaries. Another one is with the wife herself. You know, when the wife was like, oh, let's be friends, let's do all these things, but don't tell my husband, who also happens to be your boss. And, you know, she also happens to be sleeping with, but that's another whole thing. But she just like didn't do that. She like continued to have these sort of secret relationships with each of them. So, what does that mean? Does that mean that? Louise was the narcissist. Maybe she enjoyed all the attention. Maybe she enjoyed all the adulation. Maybe she enjoyed controlling these two people and being in the middle of this, you know, seemingly beautiful couple who seemed to have it all, lots of money, looks, all of these things, prestige. And maybe she enjoyed having that. But, you know, she could have decided to, you know, not speak to either of them again, or certainly not speak to the wife and, you know, just had a business relationship with the husband. So creating really super strong boundaries, that's definitely one of the things that she could have done to negotiate with them a little bit better. The other thing that she could have done, the next thing that she could have done is do more research. When she started to realize that things weren't adding up, you know, she wasn't really doing her research. I mean, it wasn't until the end that she started to get on Google and started to look for people and started to figure try to figure out what was going on. Why hadn't she done that ever before that? I mean, why didn't she try to figure out what's all the mystery that's going on here? What, how come I don't have answers to a lot of these questions? Like, you know, why the wife is, you know, doesn't seem to have any friends and why the husband seems to be controlling her so much. And, you know, she found information online later on down, like way later in the show about how, you know, he had, there'd been this fire and maybe he had saved her from the fire and all of this stuff. And, you know, so like, I don't know. I don't know why she didn't do a research before that, but clearly one of the ways that you can really negotiate from a place of strength, from a place of power is having done your research. Okay. So you're going to research your side. You're going to research the other side. And if you want to know more of, about what to do and where to start when you want to negotiate from a powerful position, make sure to grab my free crush my negotiation prep worksheet at winmynegotiation.com. That'll help you with all that stuff. Okay. So then the last thing that she should have done is used her leverage. You know, when she ended up having to quit her job because of things going on with, you know, that I don't want to give too much of a spoiler alert, but she ended up having to quit her job. And, you know, when, when she ended up losing her job, she could have at least maybe used her leverage of like potentially exposing her boss, the psychiatrist, because exposing uh, narcissists is one of the things that they definitely do not want. Okay. And, you know, when you are creating leverage, you're putting pressure on, you're squeezing the other side, you're 
getting them to be motivated. You want them to feel a little bit of pain. Okay. So, you know, that's one of the things that she could have done. And, you know, if she didn't want to fully expose him, she could have at least said, okay, I'll quit and I won't do these things. I won't ever say anything to anybody about what's going on here. If you at least give me a reference or help me find another job, you know, used that situation to her advantage. So anyway, there's so much more that goes on in this crazy show. I mean, it's like kind of gripping, like you can't, it's like, you don't want to watch, but then you do want to watch. It's a kind of crazy. So, so let's talk about why a narcissist is always watching you and what it is that they're doing when they're staring at you. I found this to be really, really bizarre. So, I mean, of course I've dealt with tons of narcissists in my law practice, either as clients or as opposing uh, clients, opposing clients, opposing counsel. Um, but one of the things that I noticed with the two narcissists that I had to deal with in my life is that they were always watching me. They were staring at me um, either in person, um, because one of the narcissists that I had to deal with was a family member. And, um, you know, so I noticed that this person was always kind of watching me and sort of staring at me. And, or the other person who was uh, in my life, unfortunately, as a narcissist, they were always watching what I was doing, either online or social media or um, whatever it was. And I just found it really, really bizarre. And I, I used to talk about it with my husband all the time, who, of course, my husband didn't know narcissists or understand narcissism or had never studied it. So, you know, he was like, oh, they probably just like you, maybe they admire you or something like that. I mean, but I just remember thinking it was really kind of creepy. Like, why are, are these people watching me? Um, because it wasn't normal, like, oh, I happen to notice what this person is wearing or something. It was like watching me. And, and as I started to study narcissism and really learn about the personality because I was trying to learn so that I could be a better lawyer and learn how to negotiate better and become more of a master in dealing with narcissists in the negotiating realm. I was also learning about narcissists in general. And one of the reasons that I found that they're constantly watching you and they're constantly staring at you is because they are trying to take you in you know, it, they need that endless amount of supply. So they're studying you, they're watching you to see what it is that you're doing because they want to emulate you. They want to be you. They want to be like you. They be, you become a narcissist target because you have so much value. And that's like the really crazy thing because they start devaluing you right away after the, the love bomb phase. Um, and if you want to know more about narcissistic devaluing, check out my video on narcissistic devaluing. But especially covert narcissists, they really are kind of studying you, but in a, in a covert way. Um, and I have a couple of videos on covert narcissists, which is covert narcissists in relationships and covert, um, the covert passive aggressive narcissists. And the two narcissists that I had to deal with were both covert narcissists. And, and the covert narcissists are the ones that are going to be more likely to be kind of staring at you and watching you and, and studying you because they want to take you in. They want to actually kind of, I felt like the one narcissist in my life was almost trying to like step into my shoes and, and push me aside and, or, or like disappear me. Um, and, and it was the strangest thing. It's like, it's, it wasn't just admiration. It was this odd sort of pod thing. Like I'm going to take over everything that you've done and take credit for it. And I'm, I'm attaching myself to you to, um, but I'm doing this because I want to just sort of like become you. 
Um, and, and rather than trying to do these things all on their own, because narcissists don't feel like they have the ability to uh, become things on their own. They don't, they don't have any sense of self. They have no sense of self-worth. So what they do is they attach themselves to people who have the qualities that they want. That's the type of narcissistic supply. So, so they're watching you because they're kind of like obsessed with you in a lot of ways. So that's one of the reasons that they are always watching you. Another reason that they're always watching you is to actually attract you because they want you to uh, be part of their world. They want, to, you, they want you to like them, at least initially. They want you to be under their web of control. They need you to become that narcissistic supply for them. Um, another reason that they're always watching you is because they are hoovering you. So maybe it's you're into the discard phase or, uh, and, and, and now you've discarded them or even if they've discarded you, but they still, even if they're discarding you, want you to continue to be a source of supply for them. They'll keep you, I heard somebody say, it's almost like they keep people on shelves that you know could potentially be narcissistic supply down the road and they just, it's almost like they're, they're saving you uh, like in jars or something and they can pull it back out if they want to, if they need to. So they'll come back and hoover at you again to try to get you to um, become part of that narcissistic supply again. Um, so that's one of the reasons why they stare or they watch you um, also. And another reason that they do it is because they want to intimidate you. So um, sometimes if, um, if you, uh, if they, I've seen this actually like in depositions and things like that, where somebody's trying to divorce a narcissist and they'll, they'll actually stare at that person who's being deposed um, because they want to intimidate that person or they want to be like, you know, you better be careful about what you're going to say or what you're about to do because, you know, I'm watching you kind of a thing. Um, and it can be kind of, um, you know, scary or intimidating, especially if you're dealing with a malignant narcissist. And if you've seen um, a narcissist, you know, watching you and you've experienced it, give me a, I've experienced this in the comments. Just comment below, I've experienced this um, and let me know what your experience has been with them watching you like this. I mean, it's super creepy. It's really weird. I, you know, if you don't know anything about narcissists, if you haven't been studying this or watching videos like mine and really understanding the personality of a narcissist, you might think, what the heck are you doing? Why are you staring at me? But there's a number of reasons why they do that. So, um, and the last reason why a narcissist might happen to stare at you is because they want your attention. So they just are like watching you because they want you to watch them back. They want you to stare back at them. They want to get your attention. So, you know, everything is wrapped up in getting some sort of supply for a narcissist and they get, they get supply from getting your attention. They get supply from hoovering you and trying to get you back and get you back into their web of control. They get supply from intimidating you. Um, and they get supply from watching you and trying to become you and, and, and devaluing you so that, you know, they can get as much supply from you as they possibly can and control you. So, um, of course, that's why they stare at you. That's why they watch you. It is really bizarre and, and, um, I, I remember feeling extremely uncomfortable and not liking it at all and knowing that there was something wrong with it, but not knowing why. So I'm going to be giving you five, five compelling reasons that covert narcissists are always watching you. And it's really crucial to understand what a covert narcissist is and how it differs from the more 
well-known overt narcissists. Covert narcissists, unlike their overt counterparts, aren't as openly self-centered and, and self-aggrandizing as the, the covert narcissist. Instead, they, they display a pattern of modesty. They almost play the victim, you know, instead of like that overt narcissist that goes in and demands the best table and the restaurant or, you know, sort of holds court wherever they go. They're like hypersensitive and, and almost like defensive and they operate under the, under the risk. Radar. They kind of pretend like they don't want attention to themselves. And it makes their, their behavior much more difficult to recognize. Reason number one that they're sort of always watching you is that they're always on the hunt for information. They're constantly watching you because they're meticulously trying to glean information about your behavior. They're watching your reactions. They're watching your habits. Why are they doing that? They want to be able to weaponize this behavior against you eventually. Remember, with a narcissist, you're either for them or you're against them. And, and if you're against them, you're going to be public enemy number one, especially in a negotiation. And so they're constantly watching to see, are you for me or are you against me? They want to see, what do you like? What do you don't like? Are you for me or are you against me? So let's say, you know, you like classic novels. And, and in that case, they might want to steer this conversation or manipulate this conversation toward, are you going to be for me or are you going to be against me? Are you my perfect mate or are you not my perfect mate? Because if you don't like exactly what I like, then maybe, you know, you're not perfect for me. That's how they are, you know, like, even if you, you, if you don't align exactly with me, then you're not going to be for me anymore because that's how they are. You know, they're constantly looking to see that. And, and, and if you're out in public and, and you, you say, well, I don't necessarily like that anymore. They use that as like a personal affront. They, they actually see that as you're now belittling them in some way. They see this as a public confrontation and they use this as you did this to me in a group setting and they, they want to use this and they retaliate against you in some way and they'll watch you. They'll, they'll be watching to see how did you behave against them in this way. They're constantly watching, constantly observing how are you behaving with me? You know, are you for me? Are you against me? You know, so they're constantly watching you because they're going to use this information. They're going to weaponize this information against you. The next reason they're constantly watching you is for control. They're, they're yearning for control. And by observing you, they can identify vulnerabilities, insecurities, weaknesses, which they will exploit and use against you to maintain and establish control. And they, they start with this early on during the love bombing phase, by the way. And it manifests even in a professional relationship where they deliberately put you in uncomfortable situations to assert their dominance. And, and we're talking about covert narcissists here. But I'm not talking about dominance is a dominant overt narcissist. We're talking about covert narcissists. So let's say a partner is aware of their partner's anxiety around social gatherings. So they might insist that their partner attend these events frequently even though their partner has anxiety around attending social gatherings. So they'll say, you know, we have to go, we must go to perpetually throw their partner off balance. And they do this so that their partner becomes dependent upon them for emotional support. So they purposely do that to make them even more anxious. That's what the, the kind of thing that they'll do. It's very stealth. 
It's very manipulative. So that's number two. Number three is what I call like a pretend connection. The third reason that they will be watching you. It's to sort of create a, like a pretend connection with you. So they'll watch you to see what it is that you're into so that they can say, oh, I also love whatever it is that you're into so that they can kind of suddenly adopt the same thing that you're into and have this pretend shared connection with you. And, you know, it isn't a, a true genuine interest. They just, it's a tactical move to create an illusion of compatibility. And it, obviously it ends up wearing off after a while. This is more like a, a love bombing move that they have, right? You know, it is so fake and obviously they're fakers. And if you agree with me, put fakers in the comments, you know, and if you've seen any of these things so far, just put something in the comments to let me know what you've seen so far. I have a, you know, a video on love bombing and, you know, I highly recommend that you check out my, my video on love bombing as well. And if you're trying to disarm narcissists, I have a free phrases for disarming narcissists, which you can get at disarm the narc. Dot com that will help you as well so just disarm the narc.com and get my free phrases for disarming narcissists as well the next one is mimicking social cues that's the reason number four they struggle with empathy and they struggle with you know what to do uh, for empathy so they watch real people and know what to do and so that they know how to behave they know how to act they watch you closely studying how you express sympathy or joy and then mirror these behaviors so that they know how to fit in. Think of it this way, like suppose a covert narcissist like observes their friend consoling someone who's upset, they might store this interaction sort of like in their behavioral bank, like replicating it in the future to appear uh, like empathetic and caring, even though these emotions may not genuinely resonate with them. So they're like, oh, that's what I'm supposed to do, right? Okay, so that's reason number four. And by the way, if you need support, you need additional support and you need therapy, I have a sponsor on this channel, which is better help. And don't sit there alone. Don't sit there isolated. Get the help and support that you need. Just go to betterhelp.com forward slash Rebecca Zung and get the therapy and help that you need. We receive commissions on that. It doesn't cost you any extra. It's just that we want you to have access to help and support that you can trust. And also I have a free private Facebook group that you can get the help and support that you need in as well. And that's Narcissist Negotiators with Rebecca Zung. Please get help and support that you can trust and that you need. Because, you know, I know when you're dealing with narcissists, it's extremely, extremely painful, helpless. You feel helpless. You feel powerless. All right. The last reason is reason number five, and that's the hunt for praise and validation. Reason number five is like their ceaseless, ceaseless hunt for praise and validation. Covert narcissists, they want, you know, that endless black hole. They want to constantly looking for what will impress you or what pleases you. So they align their actions accordingly and they stage scenarios to um, exhibit qualities and achieve their a desired admiration accordingly. So you're, you know, they're looking to see, okay, are they looking at me? Are they watching me? And so they, you know, they, they look to see, are you seeing what I'm doing? Right. So am I caught in the act doing what I'm supposed to be doing? Not doing something good for somebody because that's the right thing to do, but because am I being watched doing the right thing? So, so that I can get praised. Like they're the first person who shows up at the hospital because, you know, the right people might be watching or whatever. There you have it. The fascinating yet strange, unnerving five reasons that covert narcissists are always watching you. And it's crucial to understand that these behaviors, we can watch them, we can learn from them and 
become stronger as a result. Use them as lessons. Knowledge is power. You know, we can use it as, as a shield and we can use it as, in a way, as a sword, right? And the more we comprehend this, the better and stronger that we can be. Remember, they're not going to change, but you can certainly change. And you are capable and you are resilient. You are strong and you can keep moving forward. You can keep learning. And every day you can become a better version of yourself. Okay. So let's talk about this book. It's called Prepare to be Tortured. The author is A.B. Jameson. I've never met this guy, but uh, apparently he is uh, a psychologist and also a guy who has had the misfortune of dating several narcissists until he realized what the heck was going on. And so he decided to write a book about it. So this book, it's, it's a small book, but it's actually also very small print. Uh, but I just got it on Amazon and I'll make sure I drop a link to it below so that if you guys want it, you can grab it too. There are 16 different chapters in this book. And that what I love about the introduction is he straight up says, narcissists are bad news. Yeah, that's putting it mildly, huh? Okay, so he also talks about why he was targeted, partially being a nice guy, and partially also because I gave off signals that I would tolerate this behavior. You know, you don't get your goals, you get your standards. That's one of my favorite quotes, and it's so true. And, you know, for me, I dealt with a couple of narcissists in my own personal life, one in a business setting and one as an extended family member. And I found myself going, well, I don't want to, you know, make waves or I'll just, you know, go along. Um, you know, I, it, how bad could it be? You know, maybe it'll get better. Maybe they'll see the error of their ways or maybe they'll see you know, what a good person I am for them or how much I do for them. Um, or maybe they'll just stop. I mean, you know, in the moment you don't, you don't think out long term, right? You just think, well, I don't know, there's some signs, but uh, there's other stuff that's good, you know? And so that's what you end up doing. So, but what he claims in this book is by reading this, you will be able to spot and avoid them and you will be able to survive them and be a stronger person and be less likely to attract them in the future, which sounds amazing, right? So chapter one, he talks about the idealization phase, which uh, oftentimes is called love bombing. And if you want to know more about love bombing, check out my video on love bombing, where I go into much more detail on that. But basically, he talks about how this is the phase where they are almost sort of grooming you. They're looking to see if you are going to be a good source of supply for them. They appear to be perfect, and they're actually excellent at reading people. So whatever holes you have in your life, they're there to plug them. They're there to fill them. They're there to be that person. They want to be your person. But even at that point, you start to see some little holes in their story. So the example that he gives in this book is, somebody, you know, who's starting to date this guy. And a couple of weeks in, he mentions he has two ex-wives and you're like, no, I'm pretty sure he only mentioned that he had one and he knows he only mentioned one, but he tells you that, no, he definitely told you two. And then when you don't say anything, ah, okay, you've passed their wicked test, their test of toxicity, which is, Okay, it confirms that you're going to let it go. It confirms that he has the upper hand. It confirms that you're going to be a good source of supply. Then he goes into chapter two, which is the devaluation phase, the testing period. This is now, he calls it the now let's just see phase. Um, he sets a test like arriving late, forgetting to call, you know, just doing these things that are like, oh, I thought we were on a pattern here. I thought we were responding to each other right away. But then the other person may be upset that you didn't respond right, right away, but they want to make sure that you're being tested. And then when you ask them about it, now they spin it on you. Now the projection starts. Oh, I'm busy. You know that. Uh, I, I can't be at your beck and call. What do you expect? You know, things like that. And then you end up being feeling guilty or feeling like, oh, I'm sorry. And maybe you even actually apologize for it. 
and you actually think, okay, maybe there is something wrong. Maybe I, I was being overly, um, you know, nagging or whatever. So then the testing continues, right? And sometimes they push it a little too much, even in this phase, and you go, ah, oh, forget it. I'm not going to want to be with this person. And so he actually talks about that in the book, and he gives the example of when you decide you don't want to do that, that's when this person in the example in the book, he said, has lets them, himself into your house with this spare key. He makes you breakfast. There he is. You can't get rid of him. You know, now all of a sudden, the, that overwhelming, to me, it's almost like you can't breathe overwhelming, like they're right in your space and they're proving to you how wonderful they are once again. And so there you go. You ignore all the red flags because you know what? It can be so good. The good is like so much better than anybody else. So you have these extreme, you know, situations. It's extremely awesome. And then it's extremely horrible as well. But they want you to just forget about the extremely horrible. Forget about that. Let's move on. You know, the, the past is past. Now we're moving forward. Okay. And so that's um, chapter two. Then the next chapter, he talks about the discard phase. And I've talked about this before. If you want to check out my video on that, you can definitely do that. But, you know, this is where this, you see the birth of the smear campaign. This is where you start to see, whether it's you discarding or them discarding, this is when you really start to see, um, you know, war happening. Because for a narcissist, it, you're either for them or, or against them. You're either a source of supply or you're going to be a source of supply in a different way. So you're either going to be a source of grade A diamond level supply with your adulation and... Um, being under their full control, or you're going to be the next grade level down, which is going to be, then I'm going to prepare to torture you, right? Because that's when the real torture begins. That's when it's like full on war, you become public enemy number one. And that's what we see at the disintegration of the relationship, whether it's a business relationship or a divorce situation or a romantic relationship that's disintegrating, that's when you start to see that you become public enemy number one. Okay. So, and that's what he says. Chapter four is it's time to be tortured because you're either going to give them supply in one way, or you're going to give them supply in another way. Uh, and, and, you know, during this phase, you might actually also see that hoovering. You might see like obsessive texting or showing up or maybe even stalking you. Um, you know, they want to make sure that you don't forget. Um, he talks about narcissists and how they have this endless need for attention. Uh, that's in chapter five. In chapter six, he talks about their obsessive need for control. He actually says um, that 16% of the, of the population is narcissistic, and that equates into a one in six chance that either you, me, or someone very close by will indeed be a narcissist. How fun is that? All right, so um, in one of the quotes that he has in here, which I thought was really interesting, which is, by the time you start to feel like you're being used, or you start to begin to doubt yourself, you're already in too deep, which is definitely was my experience as well. He actually also talks about narcissists as friends, and um, he goes into a little bit of narcissists in the workplace and how narcissists can be out narcissist by other people um, and how they use social media. And he talks about dating a narcissist from start to finish in 50 steps and narcissists and money. And then he actually goes into a whole chapter of red flags, which is um, how you will be able to spot and avoid narcissists in the future. You know, uh, promises won't be kept. Uh, everything is taken for granted. I mean, I remember with the narcissist, one of the narcissists that I had to deal with, I just, I felt like being in their space was the price for, you know, like, like I, I had to do something of value for them in order to be in their space. Like that was the price. And then, then you weren't going to be appreciated for it. It was just like, that's the cost. 
Like that's the only reason you even get to exist. And um, it was like really, really hard to describe, but you certainly aren't ever going to be appreciated or valued the way that you want to. And especially when you're dealing with a narcissist in a close relationship, you're like depositing, 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 you're doing all the work and expecting something in return and you never get anything in return. Um, there's a, a, a nice little chapter on here too, chapter 16 on recovering from a narcissist which is something you certainly want to do. All right, let's talk about the secret tactics that narcissists use to control and dominate you. Number one is they become the drama king or queen, right? So, you know, you try to talk to them, you try to have a conversation with them about something, and all of a sudden they use these emotional appeals to disguise their false feign. Oh my gosh, how dare you question me? What? You cannot be talking to me. You know, it's the emotional thing. They're trying to prey on your emotions. All of a sudden, you are the victim. You are the one. Or they might use fear, by the way. You know, this is you know, what are you doing? And, and a lot of times they know that you're afraid of them too, or, or they use your loyalty. They use that loyalty to their advantage. They know how loyal you are to them. They never even think about using something like regular logic or regular reasoning. And part of the reason why is because, you know, there is that part in their brain that doesn't work like regular people's brains during their formation as children, they were subjected to a lot of trauma. You know, when we are subjected to trauma, we are in fight or flight mode. And when we go into fight or flight mode, our brains become saturated with chemicals, cortisol, epinephrine, all of those kinds of things, and, and adrenaline, that sort of thing. And when our brains are subjected to that over and over and over again, it can actually cause damage to our brains long-term. When that limbic system part of the brain becomes activated as adults, then that's what takes over. And that's what happens with narcissists. They are presented with stimuli in adulthood where they feel like they are being attacked. And then that narcissistic rage, you know, so it's called narcissistic injury. And then when that narcissistic injury becomes triggered, that narcissistic rage comes flying out and they think that they are being attacked in some way. You know, it could be just the slightest little slight. They heard a tone. They saw a look. They felt, the, you know, something. And, you know, so they, they don't process things in the same way that we process things. You know, just remember that when you're dealing with a narcissist, right? So the second thing is this everybody, nobody. Remember, they, they see things in black and white. Narcissists don't see things in grays, you know, you're either for me or you're against me or everybody or nobody. You know, everything is all one way, one thing. And, and remember, when that narcissist's brain get, takes over, then that's how they think, right? But one of the things that they do is they like to make you think that, especially during the discard phase, that everybody's lining up against them and nobody's going to be on your side. And so they, uh, they've got this whole army of people on their side and no one's going to be on their, in your side. And so they start making you feel that way right from the beginning. And so, they, they, you know, right from the beginning of that discard phase, they will say things like that to you. And so they're called those flying monkeys and they want you to feel like that's what's happening. All right. So that's the next one. The next one is you know, what I call the, the judge and jury. This is where they will start to say things like prove it, prove it. Or they'll, they'll say, you know, I'm recording this conversation or I'm videotaping you. I'm going to have to videotape you because I can't trust you or, or are you recording this conversation? 
You know, they want to prove things all the time. They need to prove things, you know, or or they or they want you to prove things. Or they'll say that they'll they'll, they'll assert that a, a point is proven innocent and pr till proven guilty, you know, and, and they love to take credit for things and I'm right unless you can prove me wrong, you know, that sort of thing. But they they don't act the same way with you. You're not trustworthy, of course. You know, they, they constantly are attacking you, saying that you're not trustworthy and all that sort of thing. I mean, constantly. And if you've seen any of this, give me an amen in the comments, by the way. And I'd love to see the other kinds of things that you guys have seen also. Just throw them in the comments and let me know. And the next one is what I call labeling. And they love to label people, you know, and, and they, they love to judge. They love to judge, you know, everybody on TV is something. They judge people as they're walking down the street. They judge all the neighbors. They let everybody's worse than them. They've got something to say about everybody. You know, that person's ugly or that person's bad or this person's a loser or that person doesn't have any abilities on anything or this person's a terrible cook. I mean, they just don't like anyone. They really just don't like anyone. And it, it just, they love to invalidate people because they just, it makes them feel better about themselves and they just don't feel good about themselves anyway. They hate themselves inside. So as you, you, you do, you'll just notice that they're super judgy, you know, so that's another way that, you know, narcissists control and dominate you and control and dominate other people. And, you know, they'll, they'll be talking about you and they'll be talking about other people as well. All right. You know how narcissists take over your mind. They take over your soul. You feel depleted. You feel exhausted all the time. You know, that's why they're called energy vampires. Before I even knew the term energy vampire, I used to say like a leech. They're like a parasite. They attach themselves to you like as if you're a host. That You become that narcissistic supply to them. And they do. They take over your mind. And, you know, you wake up in the middle of the night, you're thinking about it. You wake up in the morning, you're thinking about it. You're brushing your teeth, you're thinking about it. You're walking the dog, you're thinking about it. You're washing the dishes, you're thinking about it. And how do they do that? How do narcissists take over your mind? They do that because they start off with this love bombing and they come off so charming and so charismatic and so personable. And they make you feel like you were the most amazing, incredible human that they ever met. And they mirror you. They use these mirroring techniques to make you feel like, wow, you met this soulmate. And, and you basically feel like, oh my gosh, wow, where has this person been all my life? They read you, they read your body language, they read everything about you. They're excellent at reading people. And so they become this perfect person for you. During this idealization phase, they completely sweep you off your feet and it's, it's intoxicating. They totally rock your world. And I'm telling you, it, this is business or personal. I had a, a narcissistic business partner and they flood you with everything at the beginning. And so it takes over every single one of your senses. And so here's the thing. You also were you know, wounded, you were an empath and you had dealt with your own traumas. And you also felt like, oh my gosh, this person sees everything about me. They can love me and I can save them. I can help them. And so there was this symbiotic relationship that made you believe that there was something that brought you together all of this happens at the beginning of the relationship. And then what happens is they lock you in almost right away. They want to get you to whatever the next step is right away and lock you in, whether it's business or personal, you know, let's meet the family. Let's get married. Let's move in together. Let's be business partners, whatever it is. And then once you're locked in or they get your feelings locked up and they get you attached to them, 
now the cold, now it's devalue, now it's ghosting, now it's, I'm not texting you back right away, now it's devaluing. And now they start using those tactics, gaslighting, word salad. I didn't say that, that didn't happen that way. What are you talking about? This circular conversation. And I have videos on all of these things, word salad, gaslighting. You definitely want to check out my videos on all of these things. If you haven't seen these things, if you're not familiar with these terms, definitely check out my videos on these things. And there are studies that have been done on the on these things. You know, Robert Sapolsky has done these studies on these things. He was a Stanford University professor who had done these studies on monkeys and the dopamine effects on your brain on the hot and cold and the hot and cold and how you actually become physiologically addicted to people because you're just the anticipation that they might give you that hit of love bombing. And so you become physiologically addicted to them. And that's how they start to take over your mind because you might get that hit of love bombing again because they future fake you. Oh, you're right. You know, I should have done this or next time I will. And I promise you it's going to be better. And you'll see and back to the love bombing because they draw you back in. They draw you back in with these promises of Emerald City, it's going to be so much better. And you think that it is just when you think you're going to go out of it again, because they know how to get you back in again. And so they condition you, they constantly are conditioning you, conditioning you. And so that's how you end up having them take that where they take over your mind, they take over your spirit, they take over your soul. And so how can you take it back? You just have to get out of that toxic stew and, and finally break that cycle. And, you know, there's a fantastic saying that's go where you're celebrated, not where you're tolerated, go where you're celebrated all the time and start to just put boundaries in place and leave them in place and make them strict and say, I'm not doing this anymore. I'm not going to be in this toxic cycle anymore. I'm going to stop this conditioning. I see what's happening here. So you stop, you start to pivot, you start to turn around and you start to shift that dynamic. You start to reteach them how to treat you by putting boundaries into place and by starting to have less contact with them, briefer amounts of time, briefer amounts of contact with them and start reinforcing the behavior that you want by saying, I'm not allowing you to disrespect me anymore. I'm not allowing you to speak to me like that. And I'll, I'll have a conversation with you when you can speak to me in a respectful manner or things like that. Start to show it in your body language by just reinforcing that you're not going to allow that. And, and by reading their body language too, by the way, which I do have a whole video on, on that as well. But, you know, here's the thing. You have to look at the wiring in your brain and start rewiring the programming in your brain. Understand that it's your side of the fence that's going to have to get rewired. You're not changing what's going on on the side of the fence of that narcissist. They will not be changed. As soon as you can understand that, things will get so much better for you because they will not change. You are the one that's going to have to change and your response to them. The faster that you can understand that they're not regular reasonable people and they're not going to act like regular reasonable people because they're not regular reasonable people. And so don't expect them to act like regular reasonable people. And the faster that you can understand that, 
the faster that you can help yourself and protect yourself. And so just start to work on your side of the fence. Start taking care of yourself. Start protecting yourself. I have a whole video on self-care. Definitely start with the self-care. Start pivoting. Understand that you deserve so much more. You're probably way smarter than you think. I know that you are. And you know the fact that you're here, the fact that you discovered these videos means that the shift is starting to take place. That is amazing. Give yourself a whole lot more credit than you probably have so far. You deserve so much more than you have so far. And understand that you are enough. You are enough. So start to see those open doors. Start to feel that power inside of you. What I want you to do right now is I want you to write in the comments, I am enough. I am enough. Just start to feel that right now. Start to feel that power right now and, and start to understand that, you know, you just have to rewire your side of the brain start to take over, start to retake your brain back and recondition your brain away from that narcissist by putting boundaries in place and have briefer and briefer contact with them and just start to see them for who they are, which is toddlers in adult bodies.